Well, friends, we have reached a milestone in Lend Talks. This is number 200, the 200th Lend Talk, the second Sunday of Lent 2024. I appreciate you being with me. Some of you actually have watched every single one of these 200. I mean, um, th this is, um, I, I once had somebody say to me, um, a little of you goes a long way, sweet. And um, so here, uh, you've got a lot of me, and I appreciate <laughs> those of you stuck with me for 200 Lent Talks. So a milestone, thank you. Uh, I'm thinking of doing Lent Talks in the future a little differently, but we'll talk more about that later. Let's just focus on the text today. The, the, the first reading from Genesis is the story of Abraham. Uh, being told at 99 years of age that uh, God's going to make a covenant with him and he's going to have descendants that are going to um, fill the nations. And um, you can imagine Abraham's uh, surprise at 99. And you can imagine Sarah's surprised. And... Um, and I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. And she shall give rise to nations, kings of people shall come from her. At 99. Um, so it's a great passage. God keeps promises, and, and the promises that God has given us, we keep in our own, in our own life. The, the, um, Psalm reading, which is what I really want to focus on along with the, uh, the gospel reading. Psalm 22, verses 23 to 31. I really think you need this whole psalm, and I'll tell you why in just a minute, but it should be the whole of Psalm 22. Then there is Romans 4, again, the, the story about the promises and rehearsing, Paul rehearsing what, what God did in our first, uh, gospel, our first uh, lesson. From Genesis. And then Mark 8, where Jesus, let me just read it. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man, or best translated, the human one, must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, but Peter took him aside, can you imagine this, and began to rebuke Jesus. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. And said, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. In other words, you're thinking with a, heat, with a mindset that hasn't been infused by the divine. Um, so, Peter rebukes Jesus. Jesus rebukes Peter in front of all of his disciples, though. And then... Here is what comes next. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them. And so he's now um, talking to Peter through the crowd. First time he talked to Peter through the disciples, now he's talking to Peter through the crowd. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save us. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy, the holy angels. I, I love to <laughs> to position this with Jesus to Peter, where uh, Peter says, you know, Lord, um, you know, I, I would give my life for you, and then is the one who betrays him. But in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when, when he is being arrested, uh, Peter gets out a sword and cuts the ear off of Malchus. And Jesus says to him there, put away your sword. He says to Peter here, take up your cross. 
and I love to juxtapose these two together. Peter, put away your sword. And here, he's saying to Peter, through the crowd, take up your cross. Put away your sword, take up your cross. Does this culture need to hear these words? Put away your sword. Take up your cross and follow me. The cross. Nobody wants to talk about the cross. We have people, churches that won't even t preach about the cross, lift up the cross, don't want anything to do with the cross. We're all, we're resurrection people. We've gone beyond the cross. No, you can't get to the resurrection without the cross. You can't get to the empty cave without Calvary. And the cross is so central, especially to a world of pain and hurt and hunger and brokenness. The transcendence of God means that some things about God are incomprehensible and unfathomable. And one of them is the problem of human suffering. Not just human suffering, but the suffering of all creation. And let me just put it like this. The pro it's called theodicy. In theological circles, the, the problem of suffering is called theodicy. Theodicy is unsolvable. The problem of suffering is unanswerable. But there is a response. And the only response to the problem of suffering, the problem of theodicy, is Jesus on the cross. That's why we cannot ignore Jesus and the cross. Just because a problem like suffering cannot be solved does not mean it can be dissolved or dismissed. We need to find new frames by which to view it and live with it. And you cannot ignore the cross. Now, one of the ways of thinking about the cross, it was a tree, the knowledge of good and evil, um, that brought us into the problem that we're in and the reason why there is the cross to begin with. But there was another tree, the tree of life. And the cross is the new tree of life and the fruit of that cross is Christ's body and Christ's blood. Christ is back in the garden. You even see this, he has Eden on his mind. Today he would be with me in the garden. That's the best translation for, we call it paradise, but in Hebrew and Greek and Ugaritic and Persian and all of them, the word for garden and paradise are the very, very same thing. So Jesus has this, this he's interpreting everything that's going on in light of, of, of the, our origin story, our Genesis story. Um, but you cannot get around the cross. You can't do it. A Luther had he pitted one against the other, a theology of the cross and a theology of glory. He saw, he saw theology of glory as kind of a form of works righteousness, and the cross, he said, only the cross reveals ultimately who God is. But we need to bring the cross and the resurrection together. We are a resurrection people, but you trek to the cross and take up your cross to get to the resurrection. And that's why I love this Isaac Watt psalm so much. Um, in the cross of Christ, I glory. See, the, th the theology of the cross, theology of the glory, bring it together. In the cross of Christ, I glory. Towering o'er the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story. I love that. Even Isaac Watts is talking about story. All the, the light of sacred story gathers around its head sublime. When the woes of life overtake me, hopes deceive and fears annoy, Never shall the cross forsake me. Lo, it glows with peace and joy. Bane and blessing, pain and pleasure, by the cross are sanctified. Peace is there that knows no measure, joys that through all time abide. Or in an old Salvation Army hymn by Edward Joy, a Salvation Army officer in South Africa. And I, I, I can hear the music. I wish you could hear it. Um, and, and it's just, hear the, hear the lyrics. Is there a heart or bound by sorrow? Is there a life weighed down by care? 
Come to the cross, each burden bearing, all your anxiety, leave it there. And then the chorus is, all your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear, never a friend like Jesus. No other friend so swift to help you, no other friend so quick to hear, no other place to leave your burden, no other one to hear your prayer. Come then at once, delay no longer, need his entreaty kind and sweet. You need not fear a disappointment. You shall find peace at the mercy seat. All your anxiety, all your care. Bring it to the mercy seat. Leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear. Never a friend like Jesus. Now, when you think of the cross and Jesus on the cross, I want you to now on think of a couple of things. One, his conversation with, he, he did not, die by himself. Um, He died in company with sinners. He died as he lived in company with sinners on either side. So you never should really, if you're talking about Good Friday, show a cross by itself. There's three crosses. One good, two bad, one of whom became good. So you've got Jesus. I want you to think about Jesus um, communicating with these two people on either side of him. But I think one of the ways he communicated with these two thieves, these two robbers, these two criminals, these two convicts, remember the first convert in heaven was a convict, is through music. You go, what in the world are you talking about? It's through, I want you to hear it again. Jesus sang on the cross. He ushered himself into eternity singing the Psalms. And the psalm that he sang is what we read today in the lectionary reading, Psalm 22. And that's why I did a whole other Lent talk on the real God-forsakenness that Jesus experienced, which was not on the cross, because Psalm 22 is not a God-forsaken song. It was in the Olive Garden, the Garden of, of Gethsemane, the Garden of Olives, the Olive Garden, the original Olive Garden. And this is where he, I mean, he was in such anguish of spirit and such stress and and God forsaken as he sweat blood. That's the real God forsaken moment. Jesus didn't have a God forsaken moment on the cross. He ushered himself into eternity singing and he sang psalms. And one of the psalms he sang is Psalm 22. And we know he sang the whole psalm, and I don't know whether he sang it once or many times, but I think part of his witness and testimony, both to the either thieves on either side of him and to those that are gathered, is he sang this psalm that begins with, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's the first line of Psalm 22. And then the last line, that's why we know he sang the whole thing, it is finished or as some translations god has done it and of course that those words are the very words that the high priest spoke when the paschal lamb was slain and brought the end to to, uh, passover and jesus himself the paschal lamb spoke those words and ended the slaughterhouse forever No need any longer for any more sacrifice because the ultimate sacrifice, the real Paschal Lamb, was there on the cross. What I want to do is, for those of you still kind of wondering, (laughs) what's we talking about here? I just want to read to you the whole of Psalm 22. Now, in, in the Jewish faith, they, they had psalms that came in ensembles. You didn't sing just one song, you sang it in accompaniment with others, like the Hillel hymns that Jesus sang with his disciples around the triclinium table at the upper room. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out. Well, we know what hymns they sang, because there were Passover hymns that were sung at every Passover, Psalm 114, 118. 
and you sang them all, and you sang them many, many times. And sometimes when you sang, you danced, and 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 you you left the meal singing. Um, and I I have my image of Jesus singing the the psalms, the psalms with his disciples as they went to the garden of Gethsemane. But here is Psalm twenty two, the the. The, which in the early church and the medieval period even were seen as a new kind of way of thinking about an ensemble of psalms. And this time it's Psalm 22, 23, and 24. And 22, the, the Good Friday Psalm, the one that is our lectionary reading today and the one that I'm contending Jesus sang on the cross. Psalm 23 is the valley psalm. Now you can't have a valley without two mountains. And so the mountain, Mount Calvary is Psalm 22. The valley of the shadow of death is Psalm 23, when Jesus descended on Holy Saturday into Hades, into death, uh, where, to where, the, where death was held, holding captive um, the, the, the old covenant. And then Psalm 24, the Easter mountain, Mount the sunrise, the Easter morning sunrise on on the mount of, and this is Psalm. And that's how the early Christians interpreted uh, these Psalm 22, 23, 24. Psalm 22, Good Friday. Psalm 23, uh, the harrowing of hell story. Um, no name Saturday, Holy Saturday, um, and then Psalm 24, Easter, Easter morning, He is risen. But this is Good Friday. Now remember, you never would just recite a psalm. You always chant it. So uh, let's image Jesus chanting on the cross, ushering himself into eternity, singing a song. And, um, and I want you to hear the, some of the last words that Jesus spoke. But he didn't speak them. He sang them. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. Now you say, well, there's God. For... No, you've got to read the rest of the psalm. The psalms start out with lament, um, with, with complaint even, with the problem. But here we go. Here's verse 3. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. And you, our ancestors, put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. See, this is a victory psalm. It's not a God-forsaken psalm. It's a, it's a victory psalm. You, say, you state the problem, um, and then you, you acknowledge that the, the provisions to solve the problem are already there. Now here's verse 6. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. Now imagine Jesus singing this on the cross. And listen to what comes next. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. They say, let the Lord rescue him. Let the Lord deliver him since he delights in him. The mockery, the sarcasm. It's just dripping. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? And this is exactly what's happening. In other words, Jesus is singing his story in real time as it's actually happening. Yet you brought me out of the womb, Jesus sings. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Now remember his mother's there. And so if is your in your sacred imagination that you're you're corralling here, um, can't you see Jesus as he's singing this, looking at his mother, as he sings these words? You brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. But here's what comes next. Yet you brought me out of the womb. 
Do not be fair. Do not be far from me. For trouble is near. And there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey. Open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. Now you say, what in the world is this about? I am poured out like water. Hence the sweat blood. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. What did Jesus die of? He did not die of crucifixion. He was only on the cross for six hours. Crucifixion is the art of torture. It kills you slowly over many days. Jesus died very quickly. What did he die of? Well, he was put on the cross at nine. He died at six, at three. Nine to three, six hours. What did he die of? Well, we know what he died of. Because when they pierced his side, what came out? An effusion of blood and water. In other words, it's, it's a sign that water had gathered all around his heart. And literally, his heart burst. Um, today, we say colloquially, he popped an aorta. Um, more poetically, he died of a broken heart. Jesus died of a broken heart. And it's, he's describing what's happening inside of him. My heart has turned to wax. It is melting within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot sherd, And my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. In other words, what? I thirst. So, those seven words of the cross, are some of them are right here. In Psalm 22, dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They, they pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots from my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, life from the power of the dogs. Now you say, why is that dogs coming up again and again? Well... Part of a crucifixion was, after you died, they left you on the cross. They, they loved to, called humiliation of the body, um, desecrate the body. It also was a scare tactic, um, a warning. They left you on the cross, and what happened next? Well, the vultures came. The vultures came and picked the flesh off your bones. And as the flesh was picked off your bones, what happened to the bones? They fell to the ground. And who, who took the bones? the dogs. And that's why save me from the bones, save me from the dogs, um, save me from the power of the dogs. The dogs, they surround me. Save me from them. Who's the direct answer to this prayer? Joseph of Arimathea and Nick by night. Because they arranged to, which was really almost unheard of for a crucifixion, to take down the body and have it buried and not leave it up on the cross for the dogs to take it away. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people in the assembly. I will praise you. This is where you get God inhabits the praises of his people right here. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for God has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. God has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. For you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. And what are the vows? The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nation. How do we ever see this as a God-forsaken moment? This is a victory cry. It's a moment of victory. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship, and all who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. He went down to the dust in Psalm 23. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. 
They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, God has done it. It is finished. This is the music of the cross. This is the song that Jesus sang as he ushered himself into eternity. One of the first posts I did when I joined Twitter a long time ago was to talk about Kintsugi, uh, also known, of, known as uh, Kintsukuari. Literally means golden repair or golden joinery. And it's a Japanese art form that repairs broken pottery by mending the areas of breakage with precious lacquer that's made of gold, silver, platinum, in a way that a, a piece of a broken vessel, when put back together with kintsugi, is even more valuable, many times more valuable than it was before it was broken. And the, the, the breakage, the seams, the cracks come alive and now our strongest because of this lacquer that is infused with gold, silver, and platinum. Sisters and brothers, on the second Sunday of Lent, let's remember that there's something better to mend broken vessels than gold, silver, or platinum. What repairs, redeems, restores broken vessels of you and me. Remember, we hold these truths in earthen vessels. We are all cracked pots. But the blood of Jesus, when it repairs and redeems and restores our brokenness, our wreckage, our cracks, makes us most beautiful and strongest in those broken places. The ultimate lacquer to repair brokenness and all cracked pots is not gold, silver, platinum. It's the blood of Jesus. The second Sunday of Lent. Let's remember Jesus singing from the cross. And let's remember what the cross did. It repaired and redeemed and restored us to even better than we were before.